You're listening to Inside Israel Today with Gil Hoffman on the Land of Israel Network. Hello and welcome to Inside Israel Today here on the Land of Israel Network on thelandofisrael.com. We're, we're doing our first show after the election. Ladies and gentlemen, it is really, really happening. We have finally made our way to the other end of April 9th and Israel still exists. And the world has gone on. For a political correspondent, it was very hard to look ahead to anything happening after April 9th because so much was focused on that day. And uh, last week, as you heard, I made a point of doing my show a day early on April 8th where we ran my interview with Benny Gantz, who was the 12th and final of the dozen candidates from a dozen parties, at least theoretically, that I interviewed for my Meet the Candidate series. And uh, I thought, now, after the election ended, what am I going to do now? Am I going to do a Meet the MK series with the new Knesset members? No, I don't think so. I might still, but not at this point anyway. Um, Am I going to interview people about how the election went? I could have, but no, I decided not to because I haven't talked for real on this show in um, 12 weeks. And that was kind of on purpose because I thought it was very important for the candidates to speak for themselves. And, uh, you know, I don't give political opinions uh, on this show, which uh, we have plenty of other show hosts on the Land of Israel Network who do. Uh, I do give analysis and there is a difference between political opinions and analysis. And now that the election is done, uh, and I'm not uh, affecting any votes or anything uh, with my analysis, I I think I feel a a little bit more comfortable in uh, going into what actually happened in this election and and using this as a, uh, I guess, a forum to vent. Uh, So a lot of people have been asking me, oh, uh, you must have been exhausted by this whole election. Um, And yes, it is hard work, but it wasn't harder than other elections have been. This was my seventh election for the Knesset that I was covering, and it's really not a big deal anymore, (laughs) to be honest. Um, We split the parties at the beginning among the staff of the Jerusalem Post and uh, my colleague Lahav Harkov wanted to cover Likud, so she did. She covered parties on the right, and I covered parties on the center-left. And one after another, the parties on the center-left disappeared. Um, you know, initially I was covering a party of Moshe Bogi alone, but then it joined with one of my other parties of Blue and White uh, into for- forming uh, Blue and White eventually. I formed. I was covering uh, Yeshatid, which also ended up joining together with the, the party of uh, Gantz. I was covering a party called Achi uh, Israeli, which was formed by Adina Bar Shalom. They ended up not running. Uh, I was covering Orly Levy's Gesher party, but she did everything possible to uh, discourage the media from covering her. Uh, she was very, very uncooperative uh, and not very nice as a person. Um, so I'm not surprised that she didn't even come close to crossing the electoral threshold. So there was very little to cover with her, which ended up leaving me with really only two parties at the end out of the six that I started with, uh, just blue and white and labor. And since labor was falling apart at the seams, it was fun to cover labor and blue and white. It was really fascinating to watch a party come from nothing and have to grow into a potential ruling party in a very short period of time. For me, uh, psychologically, this was was a very interesting election to cover, uh, and and really a a joy. Uh, The uh, people at Blue and White worked well with the media. They they were counting on a positive relationship with the media, which Netanyahu doesn't have, uh, to be one of their advantages. And uh, so uh, they made it 
easier for us to cover them. That they made sure that every event that they had would be on Facebook in case we couldn't make it. I made a point of being at almost all of them because I believe I need to be in the field in order to tell people what's really going on. I need to see it with my own eyes to see how these new politicians handle this new stress in their life and to see how the campaign strategists end up affecting what they do. So uh, I got to meet Benny Gantz a couple years ago um, when uh, he was just this free agent out there who was waiting for his purpose, purposeful cooling off period uh, to end. Uh, the Likud passed a law, I believe about 10 years ago now, requiring there to be a cooling off period for generals as they leave the IDF, knowing that former chiefs of staff of the army are potential challengers for Netanyahu in the future. And so I, I met Ben Gantz back then and remembered being impressed by how he uh, was uh, very tall and uh, humble and uh, he wore plaid, uh, which uh, sh really gave him uh, this down-to-earth kind of feel. And then I got to see him during the campaign as his strategists gradually took over his body and his soul. Uh, I've seen this happen with politician after politician, that I would get to know them before they entered politics and then see them afterward to see how much they stayed the same person. Uh, Yair Lapid, um, I don't know what his views are. Uh, after meeting with him before he entered politics and pretty much understanding him and then seeing him be taken over by Mark Melman, an American strategist uh, and pollster who dis really decides what Lapid's opinions are. Uh, Naftali Bennett, I got to know before he really entered politics too, and uh, he stayed the same to his credit. His views have always been what they were. Benny, I'm not sure what his views were before. I don't know what his views are to this day. Him being an ideological free agent has its pluses and minuses. He um, is unburdened. <laughs> to put it in a, a positive way, of having actual opinions about things. Um, but, and I'm saying even after interviewing him, um, well, the negative is a lot of people want to know what their politicians actually believe in before they vote for them. Uh, I'm not sure strategically how important that was in this election because... Benny Gantz got his votes not for what he believes in, but for who he's not, that he's not Netanyahu. Um, this was an election that was partly a referendum on Netanyahu and whether people wanted him or didn't want him. And the only alternative was blue and white. It was also partially uh, an election over right and left. Uh, and Benny Gantz's attempt... Uh, as his strategist um, set out for him to say there, there is no right or left anymore didn't entirely work. Netanyahu made a point of saying on the very first day of, of when the campaign heated up, uh, when Benny Gantz entered politics, um, I don't care how the left arranges its, its mandates, divides up its seats. Um, from then on, Netanyahu made a point of ingraining in the heads of the people that Benny Gantz is from the left, especially when he ended up merging together with Yair Lapid. And so uh, Benny had strategists who were pushing him in very different directions. He had a strategist named Ronen Tsur, who was with him uh, from day one of the campaign, who said he had to be attacking Netanyahu. Um said uh, you need to be focusing on security issues because you're a former chief of staff of the IDF. I'd hear a rocket fell on Tel Aviv uh, and we aren't entirely secure. And then he had strategists, especially after Yeshatid joined, who were telling him, do not attack Netanyahu, whatever you do. He already had a strategist named Yisrael Bachar before that, um, who was already saying it. And then when Yeshatid joined, 
it became the rule, and because Yeshatid took over the campaign, you basically can't attack Netanyahu in a serious kind of way because the whole point is to win voters away from Likud. That's the way you can win the election if you actually get people to move over from the center-right block to the center-left block. And uh, Netanyahu is all-powerful in the eyes of the center-right voter, and there's just no point in, in even trying to dent that armor was what those strategists set out. I don't know in retrospect who was right. And you had three former chiefs of staff of the IDF. Two days before the election, Shaul Mofaz came in and endorsed Benny Gantz too. Then you had four chiefs of staff of the IDF who all say we can keep you just as secure, if not safer, than Netanyahu while also being clean. We didn't hear that message so much during the campaign. Uh, they focused on the corruption. It didn't make an impact. Uh, they didn't focus on security. There was one day they called a press conference where they started off by showing some numbers of rockets and other things launched from Gaza, and then they changed the subject after a minute, and then it ended up being that no one wrote about that from the press conference. You also had leaks, and the leaks have apparently come from the strategists fighting each other and maybe even taking a revenge. And that's a problem. When you have too many people involved behind the scenes in the campaign, that doesn't end up working. And so it could very well be that, that Blue and White was over-strategized. Um, the strategy that they decided on was to focus on becoming the largest party because they knew they could not become the largest block. The right block is significantly higher than the center-left block in Israel and ended up winning 65 to 55. So their only chance, really, was to get more votes than Likud. Now, as we're sitting here, Likud got more votes. Does that mean that Likud got more seats? As we're sitting here, the tentative numbers show that the Likud has 36 seats and Blue and White has 35. But the final results will be released on Wednesday. And my sources tell me that actually Likud is going down one because of more ultra-Orthodox votes that uh, were recorded incorrectly. Um, and uh, the, the United Torah Judaism ultra-Orthodox party is getting one more seat at the expense of Likud. Yitzhak Pindrus, who, uh, who was interviewed here, on Inside Israel Today, uh, uh, whose parents are from Boston and from Cleveland, will apparently be in the Knesset at the expense of number 36 on the Likud list, Amit Halevi, a representative of Cleveland in the Knesset, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you can't get them into the World Series, yet you can get them into the Knesset. The Likud would go down to 35, which means it's a tie, right? No, it's not a tie. Blue and white won. Because the Likud, as part of their attempt to make sure that votes on the right would not be wasted, gave the 28th spot on the Likud list to Rabbi Eli Ben-Dahan, a member of Knesset from Bayit UD, whose allegiance remains to Bayit UD, which is now part of the Union of Right-Wing Parties. And so, sorry, but it will end up being 35 seats for blue and white, and 34 for liquid. And so, in retrospect, this strategy to get more seats was the right strategy. Um, they were counting, though, on, on winning by more than one. They were counting on winning by four or five, because then that could show the president, hey, look, this is a significant factor you have to be taking into account. And uh, one that's not even one won't really cut it. And, and Wednesday night at 8 p.m., Rivlin is supposed to appoint Netanyahu formally to form a government. Perhaps if the Likud had succeeded even better in Netanyahu's strategy of robbing votes from his satellite parties and driven another party or two under the electoral threshold, then Blue and White actually would have gotten three, four more seats than Likud, which is what their strategists aimed to do. So that was the strategy 
of blue and white. And, and now that really segues us into the strategy of Likud. So uh, the Likud in past years has used brilliant strategists like our own Shaviv, Moti Morel. Uh, this time around, their strategist was an experienced fellow named Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, you know, th- there were people who worked for him. There was a guy in the Ofer in Bar. Um, there were young people, Sruli Einhorn, Netanyahu's strategist, uh, a t- campaign guy. Uh, there was uh, John McLaughlin, the pollster from America, was involved. The spokesman, Yonatan Urich, uh, his son, Yair Netanyahu, played more of a role than ever before. Uh, but everyone in the Likud says the decisions were made by Netanyahu himself, that, that he really, really did. Everyone in the Likud says that the decisions were really made by Netanyahu himself, that he really did run that campaign. And so what would, did what was Netanyahu's strategy? Well, to uh, attack his three rivals in a smart way. Three rivals. Am I talking about Gantz, Lapid, and, and Bogi alone? No. I'm talking about Avichai Mandelblit, the Attorney General, about Benny Gantz and about the president. And each one of them, he found a way to attack. So the way that he attacked the attorney general uh, was to focus on him a lot at the very beginning of the campaign, to try to make it look illegitimate like this, the uh, investigations were continuing after the election started, to make it look like he wasn't being given a fair case, that the indictments against him uh, pending a hearing would be announced before the election, whereas the hearing where he gives his side of the story is only after the election. And Netanyahu talked about these investigations so much that when the indictment pending a hearing in three different cases, including one for bribery, was announced, everybody had already formed an opinion. There was no news there that really surprised anyone. And that allowed... Netanyahu to actually emerge from it unscathed politically. His party didn't end up going down in the polls. The second attack was on Gantz, where already from the beginning Netanyahu was painting him as a leftist. And it's been Netanyahu who was ingrained in the mind in the minds of Israelis that, that leftist is a slur, uh, worse than traitor. And Benny Gantz, who is if he has opinions they're probably more center than left. Um, he's not Meretz. Okay, Meretz is left. Uh, he's not there. It doesn't matter. Netanyahu made clear that if the people are voting for Benny Gantz, they're endorsing the left. He also allowed there to be untrue things about Benny Gantz that are repeated enough times that, that Benny Gantz went to an event with Hamas people, that his wife worked for Mahsom Watch, uh, an um, NGO that, that uh, makes IDF soldiers look bad, um, that uh, Benny Gantz uh, had on his phone from Iran, perhaps things cheating on his wife, who knows, um, and that if he can't protect his cell phone, then how can he protect a country? Um, that his business went bankrupt, which is sort of true, but like so many high-tech companies don't end up continuing it. And it wasn't actually bankruptcy. It was just deciding to conclude uh, their work uh, unsuccessfully in developing their product. It's not the same. Um, There were over and over and over again things ingrained in the minds of the public uh, that were not actually true, that... If you repeat enough, people have no choice but to believe it. Um, he also, Netanyahu, very smartly focused on Yair Lapid because Benny Gantz, in order to get this merger with Lapid's people and get the boost that he needed from that to, to build himself up as a ruling party, needed to give in to Lapid's demand for a rotation in the prime minister's office if they won. Not even half and half. It was supposed to be uh, two years and eight months for Gantz, and then Lapid would have gotten two years and four months, which would really ended up being probably nothing. So, yet, 
every time Netanyahu or anyone in Likud referred to the Blue and White Party, they referred to them as Lapid and Gantz. So people would have ingrained in their mind, wait a second, I'm voting for Lapid for prime minister? I don't see him as a prime minister. Gantz, a former chief of staff of the IDF, I see him as a former prime as a future prime minister, perhaps, uh, but not Lapid. And so Netanyahu's strategy ended up being smart, and his concluding strategy to rob the satellite parties, okay? Netanyahu did not give an interview to the mainstream Israeli media for four years since the last election until he was about to leave for APAC in Washington and he showed up Saturday night uh, unannounced, basically, in, in Channel 2, uh, Channel 12, it's called now, uh, headquarters in the Ilan on the way between Jerusalem and the airport. Uh, and uh, there he gave a, a fighting interview for a, more than half an hour. And in the last week of the election, he gave an interview to almost every media outlet in Israel. Um, the Eretz Nederet satire show even showed him giving an interview to Kofiko, who is a monkey character uh, that the children watch. Um, last time when he did the same thing in uh, 2015 when I covered him and he gave an interview to the Jerusalem Post to me that time. Um, he, Eretz Nederet even showed him giving an interview to Hello Kitty. So I guess he's advanced from Hello Kitty to Kofiko from cat to monkey. Um, so Netanyahu, he, in these interviews, over and over and over again, Lapid and Gantz, Lapid and Gantz, left, left, left. I can keep you secure. Don't trust them. It worked. It really got into the minds of the people. And uh, until then, he hadn't really been attacking his satellite parties. Here he really did. Here he may, said, if you don't vote for Likud, then Lapid and Gantz are going to take over. Meaning, if you vote for Bennett, Lapid and Gantz are going to take over. Um, so, it worked. And the, Bennett did not end up crossing the electoral threshold. The Likud went up from 30 seats to uh, 36 right now. 35 tomorrow. 34 in real life. That veers us in another segue to the new right party of Naftali Bennett and Ayala Chiked. As we're sitting here, it is still technically possible for them in the recount going on right now to cross the electoral threshold. It's not going to happen, ladies and gentlemen. They're not in. And why did that happen? Well, number one, people don't like people that go against their party. Uh, their people, they built themselves up there in Bayit UD in this religious Zionist party for years. They were the leaders. And to defect on the eve of an election was seen as uh, disloyal, as really not nice. And uh, so people went back. Their voters stayed loyal to the party, even without these charismatic leaders who they saw as uh, turncoats. Um they ran a campaign that wasn't serious, saying that Naftali Bennett wasn't, was going to be defense minister. There was never any chance of that happening, and they kept on talking about it. Uh, that Ayala Chiked would remain the justice minister could have happened, but talking about it incessantly, uh, that's not what people really vote on. Um, having a, an ad that was about the fascism perfume, I don't think people really understood that ad and made them look not serious and didn't win them any votes, they could have ran the strategy that they actually were formed on to be a party that is the bridge between religious and secular on the right. That's what they said they were forming the party to do. They weren't. They did try to take away the votes from the religious Zionists from their party that they left, which they said they weren't going to. They were supposed to take votes away from Likud or even from Gantz. They didn't really make an effort to take votes away from them. They were only robbing their own party, and it looked even worse and a lot of people want there to be a party that bridges between the religious and the secular. But they didn't even talk about that during the campaign. That wasn't their focus at all. And uh, that's too bad. They ended up uh, being robbed of their final votes by Netanyahu in the last few days of the election campaign. 
And uh, the lesson from that is uh, sometimes don't take a layover. You know, I'm flying a lot coming up. I'm going to have a lot of layovers and I'm terrified that I'm going to end up missing lectures. But uh, when you're flying between uh, certain cities in America and you're limited in time, you have to have layovers. And uh, this new right party was a layover. Um, Ayala Chaked and Naftali Bennett both see themselves as future prime ministers of Israel. To be a prime minister of Israel, you have to come from Likud or some party in the center left that destroys labor. Um, and they couldn't go straight to Likud because of the negative relationship with the Netanyahu family, primarily Sarah, Sarah Netanyahu, who uh, has strong animosity for both Ayelet and Naftali. So they had this stopover, and uh, they got stuck in the stopover. It happens. That really brings us to Moshe Feiglin's party that did not cross the electoral threshold either. Um, he, for a long time, was seen as this uh, meteor who uh, was shooting up, could only keep on going up, and would uh, be the anti-politician party, put a creative people on his list, uh, like Gilad Elper, the economist, like Chaim Amsalem, the rabbi that is all about making ultra-Orthodox Jewry less extreme and making Judaism itself more palatable to the secular people, uh, like Ronit Dror, who we interviewed on Inside Israel today, was all about taking away uh, the extreme um, laws that have made Israel uh, feminist uh, to the point of hurting both women and men, especially in cases of divorce. Uh, who, she was about helping men uh, through the laws of, of this country right now that make the situation extremely hard for divorced men. And uh, she was the only voice on that issue desperately needs to be run by someone. And no, uh, in the end, people were voting about Feiglin. And when Feiglin looked like a serious candidate, then they uh, were going to vote for him. In the last couple days of the election, he gave an interview to the satire show on Ynet that showed him slapping a bare foot. And that really, really hurt him. Um he, people couldn't imagine themselves voting for a guy that slaps feet on TV. And uh, they started to see, okay, this guy, he he was saying that the party's about a lot more than cannabis, that it's about a, a libertarian agenda, that that's a legitimate agenda that people supported. Uh, but in the end, uh, between that and Netanyahu's campaign to take votes away from the satellite parties, people ended up going back to Likud, where Moshe Feiglin came from. Um, and so Netanyahu's attempt to uh, rob his satellite parties of votes was successful. It wasn't successful with Yisrael Beitenu. There are still enough Russian immigrants, apparently not only old people, that want to have a party that represents them. And I, I think it's a beautiful thing uh, that immigrants to this country want to be taken care of. I was at Lieberman's event last night, and there was a lot of energy there. And the uh, there are plenty of uh, young people there too, not just old people. Um, they have deputy mayors all over the country. This party's real. It's not evaporating tomorrow or the next day. And uh, it makes Anglos in this country, immigrants from English-speaking countries, uh, jealous of the Russian immigrants who still have a party. And they could, uh, in the past, ha had people like Yuda Glick, uh, English speakers, uh, Carolyn Glick did not cross the electoral threshold with New Right. So uh, who's going to represent us in the Knesset? Uh, the only American citizen who's going to be entering the Knesset, as far as I know, though I could be told uh, something different. Uh, there, there are two. Um, there is Hilly Tropper from Blue and White, whose parents made Aliyah from New York 50 years ago and whose English apparently is not good enough for an English interview, so uh, shows how much uh, he is a representative of English speakers. When I told him he's going to have to be the next Michael Oren, he said uh, he can't do that. Um, and Pindris, who we interviewed here on this show, 
uh, is the only other American citizen uh, who's going to be making it into the Knesset, apparently. Um, and so I don't know if, if either of them could really be that Michael Oren. Um, if anyone can, it's Sharon Haskell, who is Israeli through and through, though she was born in Canada and lived in Australia for a while. And when she entered the Knesset for the first time, I, I don't think she fully understood the need for there to be an Anglo representative, and now she totally gets it. I, I've taught her a lot about what she has to do, and uh, I'm going to continue uh, to uh, make sure she takes that role. Someone has to. Um, so, uh, yes, Lieberman's party not going anywhere. Moshe Kachlon's party uh, running under the slogan uh, where the sane right ended up being a smart thing in the end. Uh, there are a lot of people there who couldn't stand Netanyahu but wanted to vote for a party on the right and at least had him and th that was enough to give him the four seat minimum to make it into the Knesset and he's apparently now going to be joining Likud because you can't really do very much with four seats and then he can be a, a serious candidate for prime minister in Likud for the future. Uh, there's a union of right wing parties. I didn't really follow them very much in this election campaign about the very fact that they still exist. Um, after Naftali Bennett and Yelichik had left them for dead is very impressive and uh, more power to them and Netanyahu obviously helped them a lot by making sure that you'd have three parties running together so they wouldn't fall below the electoral threshold and also getting Eli Shai from uh, the former Shas chairman to quit the race so there wouldn't be competition for votes on the right from him either and so they ended up with five seats and they will put pressure on Netanyahu from the right. Will they, unlike other parties in the past that were part of coalitions, actually not permit there to be negotiations with the Palestinians? I don't think so. Um, maybe if Itamar Ben-Gvir would have made it into the Knesset from the farthest right um, Jewish force party, Otsma Yudit, um, maybe he wouldn't have agreed to be part of a coalition that talks to the Palestinians. I, I think if the Trump plan moves forward, the policy of the Union of Right-Wing Parties is going to be the same that the Baid UD and, and other right-wing parties had in the past, which is, it's okay to talk. If you give anything up, <clears throat> we won't let it happen, but it's all right to talk. That is all the parties on the right uh, that made it in. Uh, there's ultra-Orthodox parties, of course. Shas had a, a, a woman spokeswoman. They ran a lot on the image of Rabbi Ovadia Yosef, their spiritual mentor, and uh, not only stayed alive after people thought they might be falling below the threshold, uh, but strengthened themselves to eight seats very impressively. Uh, Arya Derry, their leader, who might be running his last election campaign because of his own criminal investigations, really uh, needs to be credited uh, with uh, a lot of success, uh, as does his strategist, Avi Lerner, uh, who uh, lives in Beit Shemesh, and uh, leave not the spokeswoman. So uh, I guess there are plenty of people in Israel who will still vote for a party because of their rabbi who is no longer with us. I guess that works. Uh, and uh, United Torah Judaism, which also strengthened apparently to eight seats from six, uh, they also uh, they got their people united. And uh, that was their key to their success and more power to them. Well, uh, that leaves us only with the left, right? So uh, on the left, you have Meretz, which was lucky to make it in with four seats. They tried to merge with labor. Avi Gabai, the leader of labor, was not interested. And they ran a campaign saying that you can't have an upheaval without Meretz, meaning you can't unseat Netanyahu without voting for merits. It's not true. Uh, you could very well have a uh, upheaval by voting for blue and white. And uh, so uh, that was not a smart campaign. They're very lucky to still be alive. That leaves us with only one party left, and that is the Labor Party. Okay, Throughout the campaign, there were people who said the Labor Party is running the smartest campaign. Their ads are very good. Uh, they're right to focus on their team. On all their ads, they had a picture of their top six candidates on 
Abigabai. On the number two, the general that he brought in, Tal Russo. On the young socioeconomic activists, Itzik Shmuli and Stav Shafir. And on the veteran former Labor Party heads who focus on socioeconomic issues as well, Amir Peretz and Shelly Yachamovich. Those six candidates that they had in all their ads, those are the only six who got in. Maybe if they would have put me, Rav Michaeli, who's been a guest here on Inside Israel today, their number seven candidate in the ads, maybe she would have gotten in. Maybe if they would have put in Omer Barlev, who uh, himself is a former high-ranking IDF officer, who's number eight on the list, maybe that he would have gotten in. And number nine, Revital Sueda, a, a lawyer who is uh, an exemplary parliamentarian in the outgoing Knesset. Um, uh, the Chaim Yellen, uh, a representative of the Gaza periphery, who was number 10. Uh, their young secretary general, Iran Hermoni, was number 11. And Yaya Fink, the, the young religious Zionist uh, candidate who uh, is about making Judaism look um, more um, relaxed. Being there, if they would put all 12, maybe that would have helped. Uh, but it was really a self-fulfilling prophecy that they put six people on their ads and they got six people in. But with all due respect, the fault does not go to Tal Russo, to Stav Shafir, to Itzik Shmuli, to Amir Peretz, or even to Shelly Yechimov. It just goes to God by himself. The strategy could be right all along. The strategy to paint Netanyahu as a racist and try to get votes away from the right to the left. Um, the strategy of uh, saying that they won't join Netanyahu's government and therefore try to get votes away from people that want Netanyahu to not be prime minister anymore. Those strategies could have technically worked, but those votes of people that agreed with those points of view could not go to labor because people did not like Gabai. If people didn't want Netanyahu, they voted for blue and white. If people thought that Netanyahu was a racist, then they voted for another party in uh, on the right. And we're talking racist against Sephardi Jews here, not against Arabs, the way that Beto O'Rourke said in America. And that's something that only Beto O'Rourke said. Nobody here said that. Um, so if anything, that strategy of labor maybe kept Kahlon alive because people that thought Netanyahu was a racist against Sephardi moved from Likud to Kahlon's party, to Kulanu. Um, so labor did a lot to take votes away from itself and other parties, and, and, and shuffle the cards of other parties, but did very little to actually win votes for themselves. And it was really doomed to begin with. The moment that they elected Avi Gabay on July 4th, 2017, a guy with so little charisma, a guy who turns off so many people, a guy who's not friendly, uh, a guy who, uh, even though he went from a rags to riches, is not an inspiring person is not a likable person. Um, they couldn't have possibly won. They couldn't have possibly even done much better than they did. And so they should be lucky to even have the six seats that they did. And um, I remember the day that Labor elected its list. I got interviewed there by a crew from Al Jazeera across from the polling station. They said, is the left dead? Is Labor dead? And the answer is no. The left and labor, they just need better leadership. And the good news for them is that almost any human being is better leadership than Avi Gabay. So uh, that is uh, the insider's look at all the parties, uh, except for the Arab parties and uh, you know, the uh, Hadash Tal party and, and the uh, Ra'am United Arab United Arab, United Arab List dash Balad, they managed to stay alive too, uh, despite the boycotts that there were in the Arab sector. They were mad not at Israel for passing the Jewish nation state law, but at the Arab members of Knesset for not serving them very well. Uh, they should be very happy with the six and four seats that the two parties got. Now that's all of them. Uh, that's what happened during the election. Thank you for listening to me rant over here inside Israel today, and a uh, happy Passover from here in Jerusalem. Bye-bye. Experience the best-kept secret in the land of Israel, the Arugot Farms and Retreat Center. 
headquarters of the Land of Israel Network. Join Ari Abramowitz and Jeremy Gimpel May 6, 2019 to encounter the Judean frontier. Our Passover visit is already sold out. For more information, email tours at thelandofisrael.com. That's tours at thelandofisrael.com.